Well, hello everyone and welcome to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Walsh. Today we're talking to Debbie Wilson. She's based out in the United States and we'll be asking her how her faith has led her to the lifestyle she's doing. So many people with the pandemic has been affected in several ways. But she believes it doesn't matter what pain you're going through, if you truly believe, if you believe in your faith, you could get through any challenge, any problem, and find your joy. Let me tell you a little bit about who Debbie Wilson is. Debbie is a Christian life coach, an author, and a Bible teacher with Lighthouse Ministries. You can join her every Tuesday as she grows your faith together. Her husband also is part of her ministry group and they together share the words of God around the world. They help you find your joy no matter what circumstances you're going through. I'm super excited to speak to Debbie to understand her own journey and how she's managed to keep her faith during this difficult time, the pandemic of course. And a lot of people struggling with jobs, a lot of people struggling with their marriages, a lot of people struggling with everyday life, challenges. She'll be telling us about her own journey and how she found her own faith. Meet my special guest, Debbie, as we dis discuss this really highly interesting topic about finding your joy to your faith. Well, right, hello everyone. Well, thank you again and welcome to Painless Universal Conversation with myself and Welsh. Today we're talking about the keep, keeping the Christian faith, keeping your faith in whatever you've done, especially um, with the pandemic that has caused so many people to question the reason of existence. There's so many obstacles that's happened to us. My guest, Debbie Wilson, she'll be telling us about her own journey, how she found her own faith, and hoping you all will find your own joy by listening to this conversation. Thank you so much, Debbie, for joining us. How are you today? I'm great, Anne. Thank you so much for reaching out to me across the pond, as they say. <laughs> Where are you based? Where are you joining me from? Because I'm in North Carolina, the southeast part of the United States. Oh, I've not been to North Carolina yet, but I've had I've had really amazing things about the place and in the you know, the beauty of the air, the quality, it depends where you are. Yeah, I've not been, but I hope um, that we enjoy our conversation today because I think we have so much to talk about and we will start with a simple question in simple words. Who are you, Debbie Wilson? Uh, well, you know, sometimes it's hard to have a simple answer to that, isn't it, Ian? Uh, I, what I say is that, you know how some of us can be hard on ourselves? At least I can be hard on myself. Oh, yeah. And, and yes, so, you know, I found that a lot of people who are achievers and out there, they put a lot of pressure on themselves. And because I had that history with myself, I like to help women, especially overachievers, give themselves a break so they can not only live productive lives, but satisfying lives, happy lives, lives with joy. And my husband and I have a nonprofit ministry called Lighthouse Ministries, and he does uh, biblical counseling and I do some life coaching, but mostly now what I do is I blog, I write, and I teach on Christian living. Um, you know, growing up, because the thing about Christian living is um, it always stems from your upbringing, from when you grew up, how you grew up. What was your life like growing up as a child? Well, I was raised in the deep South and faith was a part of our culture. And I say I started attending church uh, like nine months before I was born. So it definitely was a part of my culture. Um, but it, it, it didn't become personal until, uh, you know, it, just because you're raised in it, sometimes it's almost like getting a vaccine. It, it makes you immune to it and you don't realize what you have. But I think one of the things that really helped me in my, in my beginning years was I... I, we had a simple life. Our family was very simple. My dad worked, my mom was a stay at home mom. And we, I grew up in a, in a bubble, I guess, because it was a safe time. And I could get on my bicycle and roam wherever I wanted to. I could climb trees. And so in many ways it was a simple life, but I feel like that was very, um, 
very supportive and and a great place to start life. Yeah. But you know, you talk a lot about faith in every in a lot of your work. You talk very much, very strongly in faith. When did you realize that faith became a big priority in everything in your life? Well, you know, I think I just mentioned. I did. I mention that. I started attending church nine months before I was born. <laughs> so it was, it was like, that was just part of your life. But when I was in middle school, I went to a retreat and the youth speaker there, um, he talked about the cross. Now, again, our family studied, I mean, celebrated Easter. I knew the verse called John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I knew that stuff, but somehow that weekend, I heard that Jesus had died for me. And it went from God loved the world to God loved Debbie. And that is huge. That is huge. And I came home, I was flying high. I thought, I, you know, I thought nothing would ever bother me again, but that's not the way it was. I, I landed with a thud and, you know, my little sister would get into my stuff and I'd still be impatient and angry. My mom would ask me if I was going to clean my room on Saturday and it would tick me off. And I thought maybe knowing Jesus is like fire insurance. I'm going to go to heaven when I die, but it doesn't seem to make a difference in this life. And, and so it wasn't until years later that I really learned how to make faith a part of my everyday life. Wow, wow. I'm still learning it every day. It's still a journey um, to let, you know, to let my hope, my faith lead me and just not be so worrisome and, you know, thinking so much about things. One uh, one of your articles I was reading, I think it's on your website, you describe yourself as an ordinary woman who has experienced an extraordinary God. <laughs> Could you explain what you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, yes. And, um, you know, I didn't, I, God called me into Christian work when I was in college and I came kicking and screaming because even though I'd grown up in the church, I didn't go to a church that really taught the Bible. Um, it, I had some wonderful people and, and they gave moral examples, but I really, it wasn't really about a relationship with God. And when I was in college, I had a, um, a, a friend invite me to a Bible study at her apartment. And I just kind of came and listened. And the way they read the Bible was so different than the way I read it. When I read it, I would read it and what I agreed with, I kept and what I didn't, I just kind of tossed out. And so not surprisingly, it didn't make a lot of sense. And when they read the Bible, they read it as if it was personal, as if it meant what it said, as if it was relevant for today. And I slowly began to move that way. And mostly because of watching them, when they walked with an everyday life, they had problems, things happened to them just like they happened to me, but they didn't react with the same frustration. They, they had a peace and they had a quality of their life that I lacked. And so I got involved with this student ministry and I went to a conference and it was called Senior Panic, which described me greatly because I was a graduating senior and I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I knew what I wasn't going to do. I wasn't going to do ministry. <laughs> and so that weekend, they went through lots of different ministries and I was like, I don't feel a pull to any of these until the last one. And then the last one, I really sense God telling me he wanted me and, and I, and I did not want to be in ministry. I was not equipped. I didn't know the Bible. I'd never taught the Bible. I didn't know. I, I just didn't feel like I thought our perfect God had made his first mistake. <laughs> and so, um, I signed up for an interview with this ministry. It was an international youth ministry. And I remember them asking lots of questions, but one of them, they said, how sure are you of your call? 
And I said 100% because this is not something I want. And they accepted me on probation. <laughs> But I, I went through um, I went through their training and and had some fabulous classes and in that time God began to work in me and so I really feel ordinary because I have so many talented friends who are like visionary and go get it kind of people and I'm more like the Lord says, Debbie, I want you to do something. And I'm like, no, send them, send them. <laughs> and I come kicking and screaming, but I find he's adequate for what he calls me to. Long-winded answer. <laughs> it, is, it is actually amazing because sometimes, you know, you get this calling and you always think I'm not ready for it. But when you have finally decided to go for it, what did you really realize? this is my calling. I need to do this. This is something I, I, I feel I, this is my calling, not someone else's calling. This is my calling. You know, it was jumping in. I mean, when I wrestled with God that whole night before the interview, and finally I said, okay, Lord, if that's what you want, that's what I'm going to do. Basically kind of like a challenge. I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> And I was put on a staff team. I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, and my, I was assigned to a team in near Boston, Massachusetts, which was a told, totally different culture from the South. It's the upper Northeast. And, and I was on a new team away from home and, um, and living with people who were living their faith. And I found that I loved it. I loved it. I thought that I would, I didn't belong, but I found I did belong. I loved being on this team. And I had a director who basically discipled me. I, I, I say God called me into ministry because he needed to train and equip and work on me. And I worked with high school students and I started teaching Bible studies. And Anne, I am studying so I can go and teach because I did not know. And it was so fun to see the light bulb go on for them. And as it did, I found so much joy in it. It was a shock. It was totally me responding to God's initiative versus having a vision and jumping out there. Oh, so sometimes you never know, God might just have something planned and even having a big plan might not always be what God has calling for you. So do you think we could tell when God wants us to, because you know, everyone has dreams. We all say we want to do this, 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 but we're not, sometimes we're not quite sure. Do you think we can tell when that direction is not really where we should go? How do you think God tries to communicate with your case? You just things that are just you somehow you found yourself there but how do you think we things God communicates with us to let us know that this is where he wants us to be because this is so many people asking this question because a lot of people are going through a hard time and they keep fighting that relationship someone in a bad relationship keep fighting someone in a bad job keep fighting I want to get out of here but I don't know if this is my calling I should be here what would you say to someone in that shoe on how to deal with that uh that's a great question and and you know I, I think there's a couple of things that I think of is that in different times in my life, when God would call me into something different, I began to feel restless inside. And I, I felt like where I was wasn't exactly the right fit. And uh, I, I remember one time my husband and I were on um, associate staff with a church for a good number of years. And we began to sense that that where the church was going and where God was calling us personally was not the same. And, and my prayer was that God would call me to something before he called me away from something. Mm -hmm. And he only partially answered that. Um, it became very clear that we were to leave. And we kind of had an idea where we were to go, but it wasn't exactly crystal clear. And it was only as I stepped out that it became clearer and you know the same thing i was in counseling i i was a counselor for i um a biblical counselor for 24 years and i began to feel restless and and i dreaded i started dreading my appointments i had enjoyed it in the beginning but 
it began to become a drain to me. And um, I, again, I sensed God calling me out, but I wasn't crystal clear on what he was calling me to. Mm -hmm. But as I responded to what I did know, what I didn't know began to open up. There's a scripture that says God's word is a lamp unto our path and a light unto our feet. And so I picture, you know, if you're walking on a footpath and you're carrying a lantern, it only lights the step in front of you. Yes. And, you know, I want the whole path lit up. Yes. And there have been a couple of times in my life where I felt like God has given me a destination. But more, it's like, I want you to take this step. And I take that step, then the next step lights up. I take that step, then the next step. And so I think that walking by faith is what pleases God. And so a lot of times he doesn't show us. And honestly, if he showed me the whole picture, I'd probably be overwhelmed. <laughs> I, I read some of your books, I know because I could see it, but I didn't get rid of the whole thing. Give yourself a break. And it fits so well with the pandemic time because I think so many people have been so you know, anxious and all kinds of things during this pandemic. And I, I would encourage anyone to read it. Give yourself a break really breaks down the step-by-step, -step, the two book on how to go and how to deal with your anxiety, whatever you're going through. It's almost, almost like a workshop there and there. And most of us want to be closer to God especially during any kind of difficult, challenging circumstances, but we can't, we don't know how, because sometimes when things are going so good or so bad in your life, I think that's the time you just want to, want to move away from God because you're thinking, God, why me? Can you explain why you wrote Give Yourself a Break, which is a brilliant book, and what you hope to achieve, others to achieve when they read this book? I, you know, and that's the book really of lessons that God has taught me in my life. I've, I told you, I, I tend to be hard on myself and, and I want to be a person who walks by faith. And yet there are things that trip me up and the, I, that book addresses 10 issues that not only do I deal with, but I've seen other people in my counseling. They were things that I would repeatly uh, encounter in other people's lives. And, you know, sometimes God's ways are very rational and make sense, but a lot of times they're counterintuitive. And, you know, my first chapter, I start out with unrealistic expectations. And I think sometimes, and you, you alluded to it, that we feel like if we have a relationship with God and God is good and he loves us, then life should be smooth and easy. Yeah. And, and yet Jesus said, in the world, you will have trouble. That's not usually people's favorite verse. <laughs> in the world, you will have trouble. But he doesn't stop there. He says, take courage because in me, you will have peace. And, and so, you know, he, that chapter, I talk a lot about how God uses trials to refine us. And, you know, I think that trials are kind of like, exercise. I'm not a person that likes to exercise, but I do some exercises because I want to have some endurance and strength. And trials are like exercises. And when we go through them, we don't like the process, but we like what it accomplishes in our lives. And I wouldn't be the person I am today if I hadn't gone through my challenges. And that's where I learned to walk by faith. Otherwise, I walk by sight. I walk by what I see. And the scripture says it's the things that we don't see that are eternal. And those are the things that last. And the trials we see are going to pass away. So, you know, I try to give God's perspective. Difficult people, you know, in quarantine, some of us, you know, you're you're in close quarters with some people in your family that may be longer. And, and that's just one more that we're, you know, our, our tendency is to stew when we feel like someone's wronged us or taken advantage of us. You know, we stew on that. And Psalm 37 says that fret not lest you become an evildoer. In other words, when I'm stewing on what the person did that was wrong, 
I'm stirred up and then I'm going to perpetuate that wrongdoing. I'm going to let my bitterness come out on somebody else, maybe somebody innocent. Mm -hmm. And so he gives this counterintuitive thing. He says, instead of focusing on the wrongdoer, focus on the one who loves you. Delight yourself in the Lord. Let him comfort you. He sees that. He's going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. And so instead of obsessing over what they did wrong, think about the person who loves you. And that will give you peace. And you will prosper. And he will bring forth your righteousness. Oh, gosh. I have to replay that. People need to listen to that over and over again. It is like doing exercise. I love how you just put that into perspective. We don't, most people don't like to do exercise, but we love what it does to us. We love that feeling. We love what we see after doing exercise, how the body is reshaping itself, how much endurance we get. And it's, it is truly amazing. It's something when you're going through hardship, you might not like that process of going through that hardship, but you have to also think about what that process is really teaching you. And I, you know, it's just really well, you know, I mean, you just summarized it so well. I love that. I would go on to this question because I, I read about the, this bit where you said, I like to share how God rests. And I'm like, what oh, God's rest can be applied to a person's life to help them take break from disruption. How is it quite clear what God's rest is and how that can help us take breaks from our disruptions in life? I said, okay, when I speak to Debbie, she has to explain this bit to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, there's a, there are a lot of passages that talk about rest. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he says, take my yoke, learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And, and then he adds, and you will find rest for your soul. So I, I look at that rest as, you know, we know physical rest that that helps us keep going, but soul rest, you can be physically rested and not be rested in your soul. You're, you feel burdened, you feel stressed, you feel responsible for things that are beyond your control. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that that soul rest is learning to cast our cares on Jesus because he cares for us. Mm -hmm. And, and so when, you know, it, it, a yoke, when it says be yoked to me, a yoke was like, it's a, a halter that had two holes. So there would be a, a farm animal, like a, a big ox and a little ox, a young ox. And so the big ox really carries the weight of the load. Mm -hmm. And the little ox learns how to walk in step with the big ox. So when Jesus says to take his yoke, it's like I'm putting on this yoke, but I'm yoked to him and he's carrying the load. And, and I have a tendency to want to run ahead sometimes. Um, <clears throat> but if I'm yoked to him, I will trust his timing. If I'm yoked to him, he's the one that's bearing the load. And I get to experience life with him. So I, I really feel like rest is learning to let Jesus live his life in and through me. And I learn to abide and to dwell in his presence. And, and it, so it's a, it's a learning thing. I mean, I still have to remind myself because I can commit my day to the Lord and and then, you know, 10 minutes later, I get a text or something and I'm off. <laughs> and so when I feel that, you know, exhaustion in my soul, I, that means I, I'm, I'm feeling responsible for something I'm not meant to carry. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, you said you help women um, find their joy, especially successful women who don't know how to stop. A lot of women who are successful always find flaws in themselves and never feel they're good enough. They always think, oh gosh, I'm doing this wrong, I'm doing that wrong. How do, how do I um, be me and say, okay, this thing is good enough. But you help women, can you share with me how you help women to really find their joy and appreciate their flaws? Um, 
And again, this is a process because I am still working on this on my life. So as I share this, I share it as one that has is experiencing it, but I'm still having to do it. I think we all have our own weaknesses. And my weakness is I can put a lot of pressure on myself. I, I want I like quality. I like quality in everything. And I want to do a quality job. And, and sometimes that has kept me as a bystander because I could see people who were better than me. And I think that's why God has had to pull me out sometimes and say, I want you in the game. But I, you know, what I like to say is that we have to re- define success and in hebrews eleven six, it says without faith it's impossible to please god and for those who come to him must not only believe that he exists but that he rewards those who seek him so success i would say is pleasing god not pleasing my expectations and what pleases god is if i do what i do by faith. I do it believing it's what he's called me to. I believe that he's going to equip me and I believe and leave the results with him. And uh, just to throw out an example, um, I have a book called Little Faith, Big God that looks at some of the people listed in Hebrews 11. And Noah is one of those people. And Noah was called a preacher of righteousness. And some Bible commentaries think he taught for 120 years and he warned people to get on the ark. Well, when, he, when it was time to get on the ark, nobody but his family joined him. Yeah. So if Noah was to measure his success by what he saw, I would think he would have felt like a failure 120 years of telling people beware the storm's coming and nobody listens. But you and I are here today because he obeyed. He built the ark and the animals got on the ark and his family got on the ark. And so I love that story because it, it demonstrates a different view of success, a long view, because if Noah looks down and sees what's going on here, he sees that what he did counted and it mattered. And now that's a great Bible verse um, story because that really tells us the part that, that not many people believe in what you're doing and you just have to find your own faith and gather your family who believes in you. And Noah tried, he tried to convince people in all sorts of ways to join him and they just think, they just thought he was just this man going mad. And that brings me on to that family because you talked very cautious and um, very openly about family. Your husband, does this as well he is part of the christian christian church your kids as well how was that how have you managed to incorporate your family into this upbringing of christ and what are the benefits for others who are thinking of getting on involving their children into the uh, faith you know i think that when you your family is involved and they understand what's going on. And the other thing is when you're raising your children and you, and you are a person that's claiming to be a person of faith, there is this positive pressure to model faith for your family. And so with your children, you know, my, I have two children and they're both grown now and thankfully they both love the Lord and walk with him. Uh, my son is the more sensitive of my children in personality. He's an artist, he's very creative. And I think that his sensitivity actually makes him a wonderfully creative person. But when my kids were growing up, when things would happen to my daughter, it kind of just rolled off her back. You know, she was resilient. Whereas my son felt things deeply and so as a parent, when your child hurts, you hurt yeah. and, and you want to do whatever you can to protect them. And I remember uh, one time we had gone back to school in two different places and uh, we were, had just moved to North Carolina. It was our fourth state in four years. We were camping out in an apartment while we were waiting for our house to be ready. Our furniture hadn't all arrived. We just brought the necessities with us. 
And so it was a very stressful time. My son started kindergarten and he was eating in the lunchroom and he had torn the ketchup packet with his teeth and some of it had squirted on a girl next to him. And she started screaming, thinking he had done it on purpose. And he's very sensitive and tenderhearted. So he came home, he didn't want to go back to school. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's all, he's stressed out by this. And of course, then I'm like, well, I don't want you to have to go to school by yourself. <laughs> but that night when I put him to bed, I, I remember uh, I sat down just to have my time of being still with the Lord. And he brought to mind the story of David and Goliath. And th that's a familiar story where David is a shepherd boy. He goes to deliver groceries to his brothers who are soldiers and this big giant comes out and all the armies of Israel are terrified and want to flee and this little shepherd boy is like who are you to taunt the armies of God and the story goes that David went out and he fought Goliath and he killed Goliath and he said he went in the name of the Lord he didn't have armor he didn't have a a sword or any of that. He had to use Goliath's sword <laughs> to kill him. And that reminded me that my son, I can't go with my son everywhere, but God goes with them. Absolutely. And that changed my attitude. So the next morning when we were having breakfast, I told him the story of David and Goliath. And I said, you're David. <laughs> and whatever you face today, God is with you. And I don't know if it was my attitude change or if it was the story, but but I could visually see he got courageous and left. So I think that when our children are, are tender, we feel what they feel and we have to go and get a bigger perspective from God or we can become smotherers instead of mothers. <laughs> And um, so that's one way. No, I, I love that because I have a son as well. And I, I try to do use different ways to encourage him. You know, whatever adversity he's facing, I you know I have to sit back and think, what would work? What would work for my son that gives him that confidence? Because he's, I think, he's equally like your son, very quiet, very shy. But when you encourage him, then he finds his he finds his strength to move on. With, in, in a, one of the conversations with pain at university, we always ask about pain. Has pain ever led you to um, anything in your life regarding pain? Has it ever led you to question your faith? My, I've had some painful times in my life that have uh, made me question God's wisdom, <laughs> his timing, and unfortunately have even questioned his love with some of those things. Uh, I have not questioned whether he exists, but, um, you know, when bad things happen, it's like, God, if you love me, why did you allow this to happen? Um, my mother died when I was in high school and uh, my, my father remarried someone who did not want any memory of my mother, which included my sister and I. And so it, it really took away my whole family mm -hmm. and so later in life I found myself when I had a family I, I had these fears that came up that something was going to tear up my family because of my past and I remember one night I was really struggling with fear my husband traveled we were living in California at the time and our local news was the LA news, the Los Angeles news. And there was a serial killer that was loose. And the serial killer targeted women my age. And he came in through open windows. Well, we lived in a 60 year old arts and crafts building and it had no air conditioning. And so, you know, the nights are cool in California and that's how we cooled our house. And I, I remember sitting up one night thinking, I don't know how I can get out if I'm asleep, how I could wake up, get my daughter out, and I could leave in time to save us if somebody broke in. And so I thought, do I sit up all night? My husband's out of town again, and what am I supposed to do? 
And, and I remember saying, Lord, why am I so afraid? And uh, I'd had a series of crazy, bizarre events I won't go into now that had happened where, where someone had called me and given me the name of a dead person that lives across, had lived across the street, had left a note on my door, had knocked at the door at three in the morning. All these things had happened in this house over a couple of months and then the, the news is there's a serial killer loose, don't, you know, and so that night I said, Lord, why am I so afraid? Mm -hmm. And I sensed the Lord say, uh, you don't think I love you and you don't think I'm able to take care of you. Well, that kind of shocked me because I taught high school students that God loved them. Could I not believe that God loved me? But he took me back he it was like i realized yes god if you love me why'd you let my mom die why did you let this pain come into my family mm -hmm. if you were able to stop that why did you let it happen so i had to look at those questions and i i said do you love me and the lord brought to mind the cross uh, you know god so loved the world god so loved debbie mm -hmm. he sent his only begotten son and and Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. He chose to go to the cross. And I thought about the night before uh, he went to the cross. He was in the garden and he was praying that he wouldn't have to. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to suffer like that. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to become sin. So I thought, no, I know that you love me. I know that you love me. So then the next question was, well, are you able? Are you able to take care of me? And I, I thought about creation. God spoke and it says worlds were created. And I thought of the resurrection. Jesus said before he died, I'm going to die. And three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. Well, that's power. And so then I'm stuck with, well, if you love me and you're able, then why do things happen? And, and there's a scripture that says the secret things belong to God but the things I've revealed are for you and your children that you might walk in them. And I came to this place where I had to say, Lord, I will trust you even with the secret things that I don't understand. And I got on my knees that night and I, I said, you know, even if the worst happens to my child or whatever, mm -hmm. I will trust you. To take care of them. It, and I went, to, I went to bed that night and I slept like a baby. And I have never been afraid like that again. It's not that I'm not tempted to, but I go back to that. And I know I, there, are things, there are horrible things that happen in the world, but we are made for eternity and I can trust him. Yeah, no, I love that word because I, I also get that fear. I, I'm nervous the whole time. I'm nervous with my chronic illness because people keep saying, oh, you're sick, you're not gonna live long and all that. And I have two beautiful kids and I'm like, God, why did you make me have kids? If you know that with my chronic illness, I might not live, live long to see my beautiful kids grow up. But at the same time, I just had to leave things to God and just trust the process, trust that. He wanted me to have these kids and it, they not just for the sake of uh, worrying about my chronic illness, but also just trust in God and trust in the process. So I really relate to what you, have, you just said there. It's so, so beautiful because it's something I feel on a daily basis, but now I've learned to just leave things in the hands of God and let God who created me in his own kindness take control of it. My final question before I let you go there, because you're truly amazing. You have this great quote that says, when the air sweeps, I dream of Narna. Narna. What does this mean? <laughs> I, I do this thing when one is when the air is sweet. Do you think? Na, Narnia. Is it Narnia? Narnia. Narnia, yes. Narnia. <laughs> well, I am a big fan of the Chronicles of Narnia. Oh, Narnia. Okay, yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, Narnia is a make-believe place that C.S. Lewis created, and it's really a children's book, but the, the allegories and the stories are for adults, and they're for people of all ages. 
but in Narnia, they're, 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 there's the beauty and there's the ugliness uh, of life. And Aslan is the son of the great emperor. So he's like a Christ figure and he, he dies for a traitor so that um, this traitor can live. And then he comes back to life. And whenever Aslan is in the country, it's peaceful. And in the last book, he sets up it the country like it's supposed to be. And when it's like it's supposed to be, the animals talk, the trees dance, um, people get along with each other. It's a beautiful place. It's a, it's, a, it's a picture of, I think it's a picture of heaven. And so when I sit on my porch in the spring and I can smell the honeysuckle and I can smell the star jasmine, it, it's like a reminder of, of a place that's perfect. And I think we all long for that place where there, where is, you're not gonna have mosquitoes that are gonna ruin your, your outing. You're not gonna have wicked people come and mar something. Uh, there's a, somebody that just drove up, so my dog's barking, I'm sorry. I love this bark, it's very, okay. Um, in Revelation 21, it describes heaven that way. It's a place where there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more, no more night. And so I thought of your book, Anne, is painless. Yeah. It's a place of joy. And um, so Narnia reminds me of that. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Debbie, for your, you know, this beautiful conversation. I really hope every, anyone listening will find their joy in and believe in their faith and let God lead the process because you know we what we can do you can sit down there and worry all you want. There isn't a solution coming so you just have to trust his process. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Well thank you. Uh, it's been a joy to talk with you Anne. Thank you likewise. Thank you so much. Bye.